Good morning. Uh, welcome to worship this Sunday, uh, July 11th. We're glad that you are here, especially those visiting with us. A very special welcome to you. At this time, I call your attention to all of the announcements in the bulletin. We have many. You see that I will begin a sermon series uh, next Sunday. Uh, you see the four titles. It should be interesting, so make note of those, please. Also, all the other announcements that pertain to you and your committee work this week. Uh, Mary Pace wanted me to announce that uh, the Mission and Outreach Committee will meet uh, tomorrow at 5.30. Where's Mary? Where, what room will y'all be meeting? In the youth room, 5.30, Mission Outreach tomorrow. We would like to uh, remind you of Alan Smith's memorial service this coming Tuesday, this Tuesday. A visitation here in McFadden Hall at 1030, and then the funeral in the sanctuary at 11 with interment in Stewart Garden following service in the sanctuary. Also, welcome um, some new members back to our church. They're, uh, as I told them this morning, balcony people, so you have to turn around and look at them. They're on the front row. Uh, Michael and Lee Herman and their children, John Michael and Lewis, not children, grown adults almost, their children, uh, their youth, please welcome them to the church. Just wave down to the floor people if you would. <laughs> welcome them when you see them around the church uh, today and any other time. Any other announcements or concerns or celebrations of the church? May we prepare our hearts to worship God.
we gather together to worship, knowing that God is already here among us, knowing that there is nothing that separates us from the presence of our Lord. Wherever we are, wherever we go, God is near. So let us enter into this service of worship with confidence and hope, knowing that God is already with us and that he stands eager to meet us and bless us with his love. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, you have commanded us to have no other gods that would come before you in our lives, in our love, or in our loyalties. You are a great and good God. Since the beginning of time, you have known what is best for us. You have given your best to us in Jesus Christ. You have given us countless opportunities to accept for ourselves the abundant life he would give to all who choose to follow him. May this act of worship be for us a time when we respond to him in faith, obedience, and trust. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of praise is 492. Please stand. There will be no children's moment today. Our call to reconciliation. Despite all the ways we speak of sin, failures, mistakes, intended acts, scripture tells us that we are stubborn hearted, wanting only our way. But if we pause to listen to God, and if we open our mouths and our hearts to confess our sin, God will fill our emptiness with forgiveness and hope. Let us pray together as we say our prayer of confession. We are always uncomfortable watching God when you notice how we want to sit in the seats of honor. We can be so proper, so good, so well off that it is easy to imagine we are superior 
to the poor. We are so busy completing our to-do list every day that we forget to do good when we have the chance. Forgive us, welcoming God. Fill our emptiness with your grace and humility that we would spend our lives alongside Jesus, our Lord and Savior, throwing a party for the poor, the damaged, the prisoner, the lost, the oppressed. Amen. This is the good news. After what God has done for us, what can anyone or anything do to us? We are new people, graced by our loving God, forgiven, embraced, welcomed by our God. We will offer open hearts and serving hands to everyone we meet. Thanks be to God. Amen. You have a lot coming behind you. <laughs> and before the baptism this morning, we need to install Michael Gratz as an elder. He missed the installation service a few weeks ago, so he gets to have one all by himself today, Michael. And Michael would rather be home watching Wilmington, but he's not. Three all in what set? Second? I told you it would go five sets. Listen to these words. There are different gifts, but it's the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it's the same Lord who is served. God works through different people in different ways, but it's the same God who works through them all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit to use it for the common good. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one with the other. I have some questions for you, your questions of installation. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and head of the church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you, do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead this people of God? Will you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions, will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordinary of God's Word and Spirit, will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world, will you? Do you promise to further the peace 
unity and purity of the church, do you? Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? I'll be with you in just a minute. <laughs> and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And now a question for the church members. Do you, the members of the church, accept this man, Michael, as an elder of this church, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus, Jesus Christ? Do we agree to encourage him to respect his decisions and to follow as they lead, he leads us, serving Christ who alone is the head of the church? Will you? May we pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have called special people to do a special work, elders and sometimes deacons and ministers of the word. We accept you. We thank you for all who have accepted this special call to be set aside to do your work. We thank you for this day of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. And now may we participate in the sacrament of holy baptism and the elder representing not only the congregation but our connective nature as Presbyterian Presbyterians is Madden's mom Keith who is an active uh, Presbyterian elder in, in Nashville y'all come forward Listen carefully to these words. The Bible teaches us that the sign of salvation is to be applied to children of believing parents. In the Old Testament, circumcision was the sign. In the New Testament, baptism is the sign. The baptism of our children symbolizes the reality that they are set apart in the sight of God. Baptism is the first step toward full membership in the church of Jesus Christ. It is a sign that God loves Henry long before Henry can love God. And baptism assures our children, and particularly their parents, that the benefits of the new covenant belong to all the family and not just to the adult members. It's also a symbolic offering of the child's life to the Lord by the parents when the child is too young to do so for himself or herself. The sacrament of baptism is indeed a precious privilege, as well as a very high duty, which belongs to every member of the Presbyterian Church into whose home the Lord has sent children. I have a couple of questions for you, Hank and Madden. In presenting your child for baptism, you announce your own faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want your child to study him, to know him, and serve him as a chosen disciple. Show your purpose now by answering these questions. Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, do you? Do, do you trust in him, do you? Do. do you intend for your child, your child to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love, do you? Do. And now, in humble reliance upon God's grace, do you set before, do you set before your child, Henry, to be Christ's disciple, do you? Do you, the members of the congregation, in the name of the whole Church of Christ, undertake with these parents the Christian nurture of this child so that in due time he may confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? Amen. Will you endeavor by your example and fellowship to strengthen his family ties with the household of God? May we pray. Ever loving God, in your mercy, you promise to be not only our God, but also the God of our children. We thank you this day for receiving Henry by baptism. Keep him always in your faith, in your love, 
guide him as he grows in faith, and protect him from the dangers and temptations of life. Gracious God, giver of all of life, we pray especially for the parents gathered this day. Give them wisdom and patience to guide their child in the way of Jesus Christ and the faith of the, faith of the church. Let your peace and joy dwell in their home and their family life be instructed by faith, sustained by prayer, and governed by love. Strengthen them in their own baptism that they may rejoice as children of God and serve you faithfully in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Joseph Henry Hutto III. Joseph Henry Hutto III. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll stay right here. I'm not going very far. We received some new members by transfer of membership and now we receive another member by his baptism. You want to preach? <laughs> Henry is a child of God. He has received this day the sign and seal of salvation. Do you have the pacifier handy? And that sign and seal. Oh, let's not put that sign down. <laughs> that sign and seal. That sign and seal can never be washed away. Can never be taken away. And also remind you that you've promised once again to help raise this child in the Christian church. And I pray that you will do a good job. When you're visiting, you're with the family. You're representing, representing the family and the Church of Christ. Could you please return Henry to Henry's bench? What you've done with this, I got to figure out upside down. We'll worry about that later. And now, may we all join together in the congregational affirmation of faith, which is printed in your bulletin. Henry, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he went through the agony of Gethsemane and the darkness of Calvary. For you, he triumphed over death. For you, little child, even though you do not know it, but this is what we believe. We love God because he first loved us. Welcome to the family of faith.
Please turn with me to our scripture reading, first of all, from the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7 through 13. And may we listen very carefully for God's word to all of us. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou hast overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction, because for me the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding, in it, holding it in, and I cannot endure it. For I have heard the whispering of many, terror on every side. Denounce him, yes, let us denounce him. All my friends watching from my fall, for my fall, say perhaps he will be deceived so that we may prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread, dread champion. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed. With an everlasting disgrace, they will not be forgotten. Yet, O Lord of hosts, thou who dost test the righteous, who seest the mind of the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. For to thee I have set forth my case. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the soul of the needy one from the hand of the evildoers. And now please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Verse 49 through 56, not 46. 49 through 56. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth. I tell you no, but rather division. Before from now on, five members in one household will will be divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and mother and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And he was also saying to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day, and it turns out that it is a hot day. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own, own initiative, judge what is right? This is indeed the word of God. God. May we pray. Gracious God, unstop our ears that we may hear your word proclaimed this day. Open our minds and hearts to be changed. Free us from the unclean spirits of worry, fear, destruction, and pride. And teach us, Lord, that we may follow you more faithfully. Amen.
It would be very easy, I believe, for us to dismiss our scripture lesson this morning as simply being too difficult to understand. It is tempting to disregard it and move on to something we would rather hear from Jesus Christ. Something we would rather hear Jesus say to us. We might even try explaining that Jesus did not really say that or that he didn't really mean what it sounds like he said. Now, to fully grasp the importance of what Jesus was saying, we must go back to an earlier sermon preached by another person. When John the Baptist came to prepare the way for the coming of Christ, he said, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Luke adds, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the poor. Now, I ask you this morning, does that sound like good news? Someone coming to bring fire. Good news? Does that sound like something to be feared or avoided? But that is precisely what Jesus was declaring to those who had been following him. He said, I came to cast fire upon the earth. Do you think that I came to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Is it any wonder we are so reluctant to hear, to hear that as were those who first heard it? I would rather not hear those words this morning. We have enough division, right, without Jesus telling us he came to give us division. Well, Jesus had to remind the multitudes who overheard his conversation with the disciples. He had to remind them that they were very skilled in reading the signs of nature, but ignorant in interpreting the signs of the time. They could not see in him the signs that the kingdom of heaven was near. It was at hand. And it was up to them whether or not they chose to be part of it. And like them, we wish we could avoid such all or nothing decision. Right? We would prefer not to make that all or nothing decision. We want to have our cake and eat it too. But that has always been the case in life. Life is a series of choices between the good and the bad, what we have, and something better. And just as Joshua demanded of the people of Israel, choose this day whom you will serve. Not tomorrow or the next week, this day. Just as Elijah said, how long will you go on limping, and I love this verse, limping between two options. And Jesus himself offered God and what? Money? Either God or money. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. Leave your father and mother and follow me. The sociologist has observed that comfort seekers, listen carefully, comfort seekers constitute the bulk of most active Christian laity. Wow. Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote in one of her poems of good Christians, yes, good Christians who sat still in easy chairs. The problem with that is that persons who are comfortable and who refuse to be challenged are seldom changed. It is usually only when we are forced to hear something we don't want to hear that we are able to grow. Now, parents already know about this, right? What would happen to your families if you only told your children what they wanted to hear? 
not what they needed to hear. What would happen? This is the side of the gospel that is often called the other side of the gospel. Along with that, Jesus talked about bringing peace and bringing us together in harmony and bringing us peace to our troubled minds and our troubled world. But he also has a word, several words for us, that disturb the peace. Just as in the analogies he used, fire does not only warm us, right? It gives us cozy feelings, serves as a place for persons to gather, but he also reminded us what the Old Testament said about fire. It was a symbol, a symbol of judgment, a symbol of persecution. It was a means of purification. Jesus spoke of baptism. Baptism. This is not just an act of sprinkling water over a cute little baby's head. It's not. It symbolizes being totally immersed in something. In over our heads, so to speak. Jesus sought to kindle a fire among his followers which would judge and purify their loyalties. He sought to show them how totally immersed he was in doing his Father's will. I wonder if we today are totally immersed in doing our Father's will. I'm afraid we always have sought an easy life. We deny the difficulties and the decisions which often disrupt us. And we tend to throw overboard anyone who rocks the boat. Anyone. That is why opposition to Jesus was building at a time when he spoke these words. Actually, it's been building every time he spoke since he spoke these words. He criticized those who were about to miss the chance of a lifetime to make the choice of a lifetime. And one of the reasons they were so reluctant to follow him was that he was not offering a life void of struggle. Not offering a life void of pain or testing or testing of loyalties. No, he even went so far as to say that those who choose him in his way, whether we like it or not, he said it, would experience division. They would have to struggle continually within themselves to keep on deciding for him. They would have to put loyalty to him above all other loyalties including family relationships. In markings, Dag Hammershed has a very telling phrase. A jealous dream which refuses to share you with anybody or anything else. When we choose one thing over others, we cannot have Everything all at once, can we? It's impossible. That is why the decision to follow Christ can be and often is a very painful one. If we could have everything all at once, it would not be a choice at all, would it? It would not be a choice at all. And yet we try to, to make it that way. Compromising trying to walk the middle ground, and today always straddling the fence. Jesus is telling us that the time comes when we simply have to decide. The poet Edwin Markham, Markham put it this way, I will leave man to make the faithful guess, will leave him torn between no and yes, 
leave him in the tragic loneliness to choose with all in life to win or lose. Like the poem by Robert Frost, we often stand at the crossroads where several roads branch out before us. And we choose one because we cannot travel them all. There's always going to be a road not taken. Henry Nouwen, a Dutch-born Roman Catholic priest, began to realize at one point in his life that, that his was a Civil War life. In his diary, he wrote, I want to love God, but I also want a career. I want to be a good Christian, but also to have success as a teacher, a preacher, and a speaker. I want to be a saint, but also enjoy the sensations of sin. I want to be close to Christ, but also popular and liked by my many friends. No wonder that living becomes a very tiring experience. I'm double-hearted, double-minded, and have a divided loyalty. You know, perhaps the time has come for, for some of us to choose one way or the other. You know, it's not a both and. It's not both and, but either or. There is one who challenges you and me to resolve those conflicts. You again have the choice to make that decision. And I wonder today, what choice will you make? Thanks be to God. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 419.
And now listen carefully to the good news. God goes ahead of you to be your guide. God is beside you to be your friend. God is behind you to encourage you. God is above and below you to sustain you. So whoever you are and wherever you go in God's good creation and whatever happens of good or of ill, remember that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Amen.